This week on the Pal Not Found podcast, the Yankees are starting off the season hot with a 2-0 record. We have the benches clearing in the Mets opening day, and we have a dramatic retelling of the assassination of President Lincoln in the new Apple TV Plus series, Manhunt. Coming up next on the Pal Not Found podcast. Let's hit it. I'm going to tell you a story about a girl who loves Jim. National pandemic ceased her birthday celebration. Although she knew it was coming, we tried not to tell her. She brewed some Irish breakfast, and she knew her birthday was getting corona. Hey, everybody, and welcome to episode 13 of the Powell Not Found podcast. This is for the week of March 30th, 2024, and we know March 30th, 2024, we are officially feeling good about it because baseball season has begun. We are two games in, four games in if you're the Dodgers and uh, the Padres. I wonder how they're going to fix that. Maybe less off days so that everyone's even, or are we just going to... Except the fact that the Padres and the Dodgers are two games ahead of everybody else in the schedule. Hope everyone else is doing well. Um, it feels good to have baseball back in the saddle. And maybe it feels better because I am a Yankees fan. And the Yankees have squeaked two victories in two days. And so the dream of going 162-0 and is still a reality. And everything seems to be looking up. Uh, despite some of those games being played very, very um, questionable at best, uh, I'd like to say. But 2-0 to start the season, that is something that basically I didn't think was going to happen, especially against the Houston Astros, a team that has historically now been a menace to the New York Yankees, a rivalry that, that pretty much has, if not replaced, definitely supplanted the Red Sox-Yankees rivalry of the past. I mean, that rivalry has been pretty much quiet, if not dead. Uh, The Houston Astros are really the, the team to beat, if you will. I think they've been to the six straight ALCSs. I'm getting them confused with the Kansas city chiefs now of, of how many championship games they've been to just because they are constantly there. So even though it's early in the season to get two wins, from the Houston Astros looms large. Not only does it kind of feel like the Yankees are proving early that they can win, that they can come back against uh, large deficits, regardless of how they got there, but they can play, they can hold themselves up against good teams. And even though the Astros are 0 2 to start the season, they are still a good team. I mean, that lineup, we've seen that lineup year after year after year after year. And we know that it just gets tougher and tougher and tougher as you go down the line. I mean, when you can start off a lineup with Altuve, Jordan Alvarez, Tucker, and Bregman, you're in pretty good shape offensively. Um, But yeah, we're going to get into the uh, games today. We're going to get into game one, game two. Uh, and we're also going to try to break down a little bit of what happened in uh, Shea Stadium in City Field uh, for opening day for the Mets. We had the benches kind of clearing, not really clearing. It was about the the most baseball-looking fight you could think of on opening day. So tempers flying high during their opening day because of a um, questionable slide there. And that might have been the most interesting thing that happened in the Mets game. And we're also going to break down a little bit of the new Apple TV Plus series, Manhunt, which kind of um, dr- uh, dramatizes the, the, the assassination of President Lincoln uh, at Ford's Theater and kind of goes through the aftermath of how they decided to catch John Wilkes Booth in, um, at the, um, the Mud House in, in Maryland. Uh, I watched one episode of that of that series. It is very, very well filmed, very, very well uh, produced. Uh, but I've got some initial thoughts and, um, and my recommendation coming up at the end of the show. 
Before we get going, though, let me remind everybody, thank you for listening to the podcast uh, here on here on uh, Apple Podcasts or on YouTube, uh, wherever you guys are consuming the podcast. Uh, be sure to subscribe to the channel and also be sure to follow on the, um, the, the podcast app. At some point in the future, I will start building an email out so you can email questions if you have questions. Um, and so we can get kind of get some interactivity uh, going with the show. I, I feel like that's going to be a little bit fun to do, especially now that baseball season has kicked off. Um, to to hear some of your guys' questions. So uh, in order to support the show, go ahead and subscribe and follow, leave a comment, like the video. That's actually really important. Uh, I think uh, if you like the video, if you comment at, you know comment on the video, um, all of that engagement makes the show bigger and better than it can be. Um, but before you know let's let's get into it. Let's not hesitate. Game one of Yankees baseball. I am so glad. That the off season is over, I can't stress that enough. How glad I am that spring training is over, the speculation is over, the constant "what are they going to do this year" and the constant cliches from baseball teams are finally over. No more, hey, they're playing with a chip on their shoulder. They've got a different kind of edge. They're coming into the season with something to prove. None of that, none of it matters anymore. It's what they do on the field. <laughs> I feel like the Yankees every year since 2009, and it's been about 15 years now without a championship, I have heard the same thing coming from their camp about how their team is playing with an edge. They've got something to prove after being swept, after not making the playoffs, after whatever the, the end result was, they pepper the beginning of the season with so much false hope that eventually it gets tiring. And this, this year was no different this year. They were coming in 82 and 80 was looming large in their minds as they hit the field. And immediately in the first inning, all of that edge, all of those puffery like statements, you know, really showed as they dropped 4 nothing by the top of the second down to the Astros. It was a rough beginning. Nestor Cortez uh, obviously started on the bump for Garrett Cole. He was the uh, guy that took the mantle for the opening day start um, when Garrett Cole went down. They placed Garrett, Garrett Cole in the 60-day IL, so he's going to be out for two months. So so if, if you're... If you're saying 60-day IL plus a ramp up, you're probably not seeing him till July 1st. So it's going to be a interesting looking starting lineup from the New York Yankees going forward. Uh, Nestor Cortez, Carlos Rodon, Marcus Stroman, Clark Schmidt, and they announced Luis Heel won the fifth starter job. So we're going to see how that turns out because the first three. I can kind of get behind. I can get, if they if they start performing like they're supposed to perform, you're looking at a pretty nice one two three punch. Clark Schmidt, if he bounces back the same way he excuse me, if he repeats the same performance he did last year, then then I'm I'm pretty confident. But but how how often does that happen? You know, um, that was his first real year as a starter last year. But Luis Heel, it's going to be interesting seeing him come out of the bullpen. I always feel like it's a 50-50 shot with him. So they must have been really impressed during the spring um, spring debut. But back to the game, the down 4 nothing by the top of the second. Nestor looked like he just didn't have his, his, his best stuff on the mound. It, it just kind of se- seemed like they were – he was missing location. They were kind of jumping on pitches early, and, and, and all of a sudden you start digging yourself into a hole. And then it was Jake Myers who – you know, capped a pretty monstrous home run off of him. And at that point, as a fan, you, you feel that roller coaster of emotions start to kind of build at that point. It's, hey, this is going to be a new team. The excitement of Juan Soto, the disappointment of Garrett Cole kind of gets washed away because, you know, you have that opening day feelings happen. And by the second, you feel like you're out of it. Because if the Yankee offense last year taught us anything. It was don't expect much out of them. And it wasn't that much different in that in in this game. I mean, we had 
the offense kind of looked outside of Juan Soto. The offense looked sh- like shades of last year were still there. Um, with a little bit of tweaks, uh, Gian- Giancarlo Stanton outside of this, the second game, the home run, I mean, he looked exactly the same way as he looked last year, looked like incapable of getting around in a fastball, looked like he was jumping on change up on, on, uh, on off speed pitches the entire time. If he did make contact, it seemed seemingly seemed like it was on an off speed pitch, um, Rizzo seemed seemed a little bit different, but really hasn't shown that kind of power just yet. I liked his eye. His st- still seemed like he was working those walks. Still seemed like he was getting hit by pitches. But it didn't seem like the Yankees were able to kind of get a big hit when it mattered. There were a lot of runners on base and a lot of double plays, um, including one by Judge, which I thought was at some point like, oh, geez, this is just not what you want to do. Shades of 2019 or 2020, the year that they kept on wrapping into double plays. A lot of runners left in scoring position. It just felt like that kind of game. With the exception of Juan Soto. Juan Soto was the one at-bat that felt different in that lineup. The, a lot of a lot of stuff has been said about Juan Soto, but these two games, and man, is this a small sample size. These two games have really shown me as a Yankees fan, man, this guy is good. Not only defensively making plays, including a very, very killer play at the end of the game, and a diving catch in the second game, but his at-bats just feel differently. And you got to hope as a Yankees fan that that is contagious. That other players start to take note. Not only was he working the count and, and, and laying off some really, really close pitches on the outside of the zone. Um, in, the, in game one, basically working a walk uh, to force a runner in uh, to kind of cut the deficit in half there, 4-2. But Soto... Literally, first at bat, you know, uh, uh, or first or second at bat, knocking in a run for his first hit. Uh, I think it was a second at bat because he walked the first time. Just getting on base, doing the doing the right things, and not also not looking for that perfect pitch. Right, number of times in these two games that have happened, Juan Soto going out of the zone and knocking some singles around, using all parts of the field. After these two games were completed, the, the, the biggest thing, the biggest takeaway I had was that Juan Soto just reminds me of watching Vlad Guerrero. Vlad Guerrero, who played for uh, the Expos and the Angels in his career, also played, I think he played for the Rangers at some point. I, I got to look that up. But Vladimir Guerrero, when he hit, there was nowhere you could put the ball that his bat head couldn't reach to, right? There is a famous clip somewhere of a pitch hitting the ground first and it bouncing up and Vlad still hitting it, knocking it for like a double in the gap. This is what Juan Soto reminds me of. He just feels like he has such a command over the strike zone and Every single pitch, he looks like he's measuring up the pitcher. It, it, it must be such a if – you, if you don't have confidence on the mound, Juan Soto is going to get you, right? And I think this is what people have been saying since 2019 when he won the World Series with the Nationals and when he played with the Padres. Like Juan Soto, this is why he's that special player because he's always getting on base. He's setting the table for the team, right? Just reminds me of no matter where you put the ball – He's going to hit it like Vlad Guerrero, right? Vlad Guerrero was such a dominant force at the plate. I feel like the pitcher could like throw a pickoff and somehow there'd be like a 90% probability that Vlad Guerrero could hit it. Like it didn't even have to be near the, near the zone (laughs) for it to work. Anyway, so Soto's in this lineup. I feel like it just injects some sort of life. Clearly, it was needed because if you pluck away Soto from this lineup, 
you're not seeing a lot of activity on the base paths, right? Like you're seeing um, Volpe was wa- was working a lot of walks. Um, uh, Volpe had some a couple hits. Verdugo had like a, bl- a bloop single in the middle. So there was contact made, but like if you take Soto out of this equation, it still felt like a quiet offense with the exception of maybe Oswaldo Cabrera having one of the best two games <laughs> sprees you can have, right? Um, a game tying home run um, uh, to 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 put the Yankees over. I think he, I think to, in total in the two games he went six for nine, uh, which is honestly uh, for a guy who didn't seem like he was going to break camp. Man, has he really made a dent in the first two games? I don't know what turned on uh, in his uh, in his mind, but clearly something is working. Yeah, six for nine. Uh, no walks, just two punch outs and a home run in two games against the Astros for a guy that was basically being told he was not going to make the team. God, did we need Oswaldo Cabrera uh, in these two game series? Um, going back, Nestor seemed to kind of um, settle back down, which was kind of nice to see. That rocky start from Nestor really kind of sent chills down my spine. And then to see the Yankees' offense kind of scrap back and tie the game, and then. Uh, you know, have that sack fr- that that's what it was the sack fly from Alex Verdugo. Um, fundamental baseball again, just put the ball where it needs to be instead of trying to get the gigantic hit was such a refreshing feeling to 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 see right off the bat from the Yankees offense. But again, going back to that roller coaster of emotions, Clay Holmes in the ninth, putting a lot of runners on letting a lot of hits go by, and then you see Juan Soto gun someone out at the plate. Just barely. What a play by him. I mean, uh, Carlos Rodon said, I think, uh, yesterday after the second game, that you would have thought that the Yankees picked this guy up just for his defense. And his defensive prowess was on show um, for these last two games. A thing that he was kind of criticized for for most of the offseason the guy could hit but he's not going to bring a lot of defense man did he save that first game from being something that from being basically an Astros win if you will I mean if the Astros tie the game at that point you feel like the momentum shifts and they win the game and that's why Paul O'Neill said it felt like a steal and it really did it felt like they kind of stole a game and the Yankees didn't do a lot of that last year they didn't have that kind of we won games that we were supposed to lose feeling. It felt like we lost the games that we were going to lose and we won the games that we were going to win. And this one felt like we kind of got one on our sides. And we came back from a 4 nothing deficit. And the bullpen, along with Nestor Cortez, shut him down. I mean, outside of that first rocky opening inning, the Astros were relatively silent. And that felt good, especially after losing Garrett Cole. You know you don't have that automatic nine innings or automatic seven innings, eight innings, whatever Garrett's going to try to give you. To have Nestor and the bullpen step up like that and to have Juan Soto save Clay Holmes from a blown save (laughs) felt really good. It felt like a good way to start off the season. And it felt refreshing to see that the lineup was injected with a guy who is not looking for that perfect pitch. He's not looking for a walk and he can pick up some of the other hitters when they're not hitting. Cause let's face it, judge outside of a double in the first game has been quiet, right? His swings have not looked that great. Giancarlo Stanton has not looked that great outside of one swing at the end of the game when it was basically garbage time. It was six one, right? To see that win happen gave me a confidence boost as a fan going forward. And that was cool to see. That was really fun. Some um, other takeaways from... Some other takeaways from the game. Uh, Volpe looking more like Volpe, right? Uh, Didn't seem like... They were kind of talking about it all through the broadcast about how he kind of like ditched his uppercut swing. And it looked like he wasn't expanding the zone. He wasn't chasing pitches that were bad. 
he was getting on base. And that's what you need Volpe to do. He, you need him to get on base. You need him to steal some bags. You need him to create action and create and create pressure on the defense, which coincidentally happened in the second game, right? The Yankees started doing that in the second game, and they started kind of feeling like, hey, a little 2015 Kansas City Royals vibe um, when the Astros kind of imploded defensively in the, in the second game. But Volpe seemed like he was leveling out that swing, just looking for gap-to-gap singles, right? And that's what we need. Like, 20 home runs is great, but 20 runs, you know, 20 or more runs isn't really going to do that much in the, in the grand scheme of things. We need someone, we need traffic on the base paths. And the Yankees did a lot of that in the first game. They just didn't get the big hit when they needed to. Um, Alex Verdugo. Um, interesting. An interesting debut for Alex Verdugo. Uh, getting a bloop single here and there. Getting a sack fly done to make it 5-4 Yankees. Um, some defensive mishaps, I think, in the second game. It, it, it's hard to kind of criticize someone's defense when they're laying it out on the line and they just happen to miss because like, can you really expect those plays to be caught? Because, but uh, a couple times uh, in one in foul territory and one laying out in the first inning of the second game, um, he wasn't able to get to the ball. And then some interesting routes for that ball in the gap that he ended up, ended up catching. But you start to wonder, is left field going to be a defensive is left field going to be a weakness <laughs> with with the Yankees? You start to wonder if that's first game jitters or if it's going to get any better. But I did like his bat in the middle of the lineup um, uh, towards the you know six seven slot. It, it felt like something a little bit different. Again, like I and maybe this is just from watching the Yankees too much and watching them every single day. But it felt like their approaches were different. It just felt like if they were in the zone, they were going to they were going to swing a little bit more. They weren't guess hitting. It's 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 Soto Verdugo felt like if the ball's in the zone, they're going to take a crack at it. And I kind of like that approach a little bit better because it creates a little bit more action. Um anyway, Yankees lock up the first win 5-4, which I think was important to do. Um uh, I think it changes the tone and the tenor of the team. And also the comeback win, I think, is really, really important for this team. Um, if, if we can feel like we're not out of it by the second inning d- down four, I think that's really, really important. Um, so interesting to see that that first game. Uh, Nestor, I think, pitched well and got us ready for a game two with Carlos Rodon on the bump. And boy, did Carlos Rodon just seem like he was struggling, right? He... It, it, it it wasn't as it wasn't as bad as it turned out to be. If you compare the box scores to uh, from Carlos Rodon to Nestor Cortez, anybody looking at those box scores would probably think Nestor had the worst outing with five innings pitched, four earned runs allowed. And if you look at Carlos Rodon, four and a third, one earned. But man, it just felt like a struggle the entire game. Uh, it felt like he was missing a location. It felt like he didn't have command. Um, felt like he was almost getting on top of the ball, and the ball was flying out to the left-hand side of the plate. And when he did start kind of firing his fastball and his cutter higher in the zone, he started getting a little bit more swing and miss. But, man, did it feel just like he was pitching in and out of jams the entire time. And... Um, and right from the very first batter of the game, Altuve hitting that double down the uh, the the left field line didn't exactly leave a good taste in your mouth. You're like, here we go. Here we go again. So for him to even get out of his outing with four and a third, I mean, 13 batters faced, 13 putouts is not exactly something you're going to be proud of. I don't think that he was proud of it, even listening to his postgame presser. But if you can get out of that, get into the fifth, and, and the bullpen did pick him up with just one earned run. You got to look at that as an improvement from where Rodon came from last year. I mean, like an over six ERA and he looks like he's getting better against a really good lineup. I mean, a really good team. So to even hold them at bay, it just felt like he was struggling. Um, some emotional moments from Rodon too, coming off the bump. You feel like he's kind of holding back, right? Like everyone says he's such an emotional guy on the mound. It's like, it's like 
let, let's see a little bit of that emotion. Maybe that will kind of bring back that mojo, bring back that fire that we want to see from him. Um, but uh, but again, the Yankees go down one nothing, and finally uh, they 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 end up tying the game. They go ahead two one, and this is where this really pivotal moment happens. I think in the game that that um, uh, changes everything. Diaz shuffles over a uh, a ground ball over to um, Altuve, and they miss, and um, basically he throws it away. Right, the runners advance. And the next batter is Austin Wells. And Austin Wells, who is considered like a power hitting catcher, decides to bunt like the very next pitch, right? The, de- the defense is shaken up. And from the error that happened, runners advanced, runners scored. And here you have the power hitting catcher, allegedly, because that's how he's kind of set up as. Um, bunting on the first pitch and putting even more pressure on the pitcher. And what does the pitcher do? He throws away the ball, right? This is the kind of small ball, baseball, put the pressure on the defense, put the ball in play kind of feeling that makes you win ball games. And that critical error just opened it up for the New York Yankees going forward in that game. I essentially sealed the game. And that is that that is something that I want to see from this team more of, right? You know that the defense is, is shaken up. Boom. Put the ball in play immediately. Don't try to get a big hit. Don't try to get a home run to seal the deal. Bunt it down the first baseline and make the pitcher field it. A, a play that is practiced in spring training all the time, yet no pitcher can seem to do. Um, hell, he could have probably just underhanded that ball. <laughs> And Austin Wells is probably out 90% of the time, but he throws it away and then seals the game for the New York Yankees. I love that. I love that choice for the second game. If the Yankees can do more of that, if they can put balls in play like that and put pressure on the defense, I think you're going to see a team that's, that's way above 500, way above baseball references, 71 and 90 or whatever is that 91 uh, record that that they project them at. I think that was a smart baseball play. And that's something that was it was uh, really exciting to see as a fan and locked away a game at seven, uh, seven to one after G G and Carlo finally after lining out to center in the previous at bat lines a home run uh, to uh, left field way, way, way above those Crawford boxes, almost into the train tracks. And that's a good sign. Because Giancarlo Stanton is feast or famine, right? Feast or famine. If you can have Giancarlo get hot, especially in the beginning of the season, and you have Soto, who's basically been on fire since early March, then you can wait for Judge to get his rhythm back, right? Right. Judge lost a week due to injury in spring training. Maybe he's a little bit off because he just doesn't seem like he's seeing the ball as well. But if you have those two guys on fire, man, it doesn't matter if Judge goes 0 for, 0 for 24, right? You've got two extra weapons in your lineup. And and unfortunately, the, the, the consensus is that the Yankees have to hit because the pitching is going to be a wild card uh, from here on out. So... Uh, Tomorrow, uh, for or excuse me, today at 7.15, 7 o'clock, we have Marcus Stroman pitching for the first time uh, for the Yankees at 7.15. Uh, we'll see how that goes. That should be an interesting debut. Uh, you might know Marcus Stroman from denying the starter role from a couple weeks ago and uh, also <laughs> had a rough, rough second half with the Cubs last year um, after kind of injuring himself. And... Um, so we'll look for him to kind of bounce back. Uh, and uh, we have Brown going for the Astros tonight. The Yankees looking to go 3-0 and and take the series win either today or uh, on Sunday when they wrap up and then they go to Arizona. But as a Yankees fan, I'm very, very glad to see um, this team. I, I, I think that game one, again, that roller coaster of emotion – having no faith by the second inning and then seeing them kind of scrap back was just such a good feeling having clay Holmes tug at my heart 
the entire ninth inning is something that I'm just not accustomed to since since we all grew up with 20 years of Mariano Rivera. Um, saves shouldn't be this hard. To, <laughs> like When you had the best closer in the game, any other closer just doesn't do it for you. Uh, listen, get three outs and go home. You know, let's let's close out this game by the eighth inning. But the Yankees came away with two two wins, and you can't be happier than with that kind of start. At the worst case scenario, they're splitting the series two two, and they're getting into Houston. I think that's a good feeling um, to to start up the season. So uh, good on the Yankees, uh, and um, thank you to the Astros for uh, playing some shoddy defense right there. <laughs> that uh, uh, made my weekend great. Um, let's move on to the Mets. The uh, the Mets also. I got postponed opening day against the Brewers. And um, boy, did the Mets not have a great opening day. Um, The Mets ended up losing their first game uh, 3-1 to the Brewers. And um, let's see if I can get this in. And the bench is cleared. The kind of. Um, And uh, right now, as I record this, actually, the Brewers are up 3-0 the Mets' second game. Uh, but uh, I wanted to kind of take a look a little bit at this, um, this, this kind of questionable slide. So, so the, the Major League Baseball over the last couple of years has tried to change the rules a bit to make things a little bit safer for the players. And and who could blame them? Right? They're widening bases so that. You know, there, there's more room in the running lane. Um, uh, plays uh, at the plate have been pretty much all but eliminated, right? Unless you have possession of the ball. And um, you can't block the plate, right? Like, there's not going to be a Buster Posey situation where, you know, his career gets permanently altered because um, somebody's sliding hard into you, right? So uh, yesterday during the Mets game, um, there was a ground ball to uh, that was shoveled over to uh, to to Jeff McNeil, who's at second base, and they were trying to turn two, and you had this kind of slide happen. Let me uh, push to the uh, video feed here, and there you go. Let me see if I can rewind it again. Let's see here. Turn up captions here. Boom. Here, here it is. Here's the live look at it. Boom. We have Reese Hoskins going pretty hard into Jeff McNeil, and Jeff McNeil immediately gets up and shouts a lot of expletives down towards his <laughs> general area. I mean, Reese Hoskins takes out his leg essentially. Um, luckily, Jeff McNeil didn't seem to be hurt by the play, but he was really mad at the play. Um, kind of transpiring and um, kind of spoke to the media afterwards and, and, and also addressed that, you know, it's a, it's not a move that he wants to see made. Right. Um, Looking back at the slide, it didn't exactly look like he passed the bag, right? Like the, 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 the rule, like you can't overslide the bag. Right. And so he's still touching the bag. It still looks like a legal move. Um, And, but anytime, the, I felt like the reaction was just a little bit too extreme. I mean, this is part of the game. They've done everything that they possibly can to strip back all the physicality from the game. In fact, now, like, the, you know, a lot of these injuries aren't even happening because of player to player contact. They're happening because the player, you know, Aaron Judge got, got injured last year because he ran into a wall, right? Like, um, Giancarlo Stanton got injured just because he ran, right? Like, there's no player-to-player contact really that much anymore. I mean, Rizzo got a concussion because of a freak play, but that was something that's like one in a million, right? Like, these old-school plays are not happening anymore. And Jeff McNeil got up, got really emotional, and and started sh- shouting. The benches ended up clearing. Um, you know, no... F- you know, fists were thrown or anything like that, but a lot of yelling, a lot of parting ways. And eventually they came back and said, no, it was a legal slide, right? They, they actually looked at it to see if there was a, a legal slide contact, which would have, I think, in, um, you know, made a double play happen. Um, but every single time that there is this kind of play, it does, and this kind of reaction to it, it does kind of make me feel like we are not witnessing the baseball the way that our parents had, right? Like 
this is not that hard of a slide. I mean, it's 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 part of the game, right? It's a little physicality, and you understand that the Mets are probably a little bit more sensitized to this because of Miguel Tejada, right? Same type of play. Um, I think it was Chase Utley, if I'm not mistaken, went straight into his legs, and Tejada was never the same, right? He was never the same shortstop for the Mets. He was the shortstop for the Mets. He came back. He was not the same player, right? Those things you never want to see happen. But this slide, I don't think it's, it was as intentional. And it made me think of uh, the Willie Randolph slide from uh, the 1977 ALCS. And I got it here. Uh, I think it's, it's McCray, right, for the Royals. This play here. I mean, this. Pitch to Brett. Oop, I'm gonna take out the uh, sound here. This slide. Oh, I mean, this is a wrestling move. I mean, this is not, this is, this is not a baseball slide. This is no longer part of the sport at this point. I mean, he's, if you freeze frame it, they'll probably show it again here in a, in a quick second. I mean, you can understand why Willie Randolph is mad about this slide, right? This is the most physical slide I've ever seen. There, there's another baseball play, too. I think it's Bobby Bonilla, if I'm not mistaken, who just takes out someone in the middle of the baseline. I mean, that, like, entertainment, you know, value aside, I mean, that's, that's a little bit much. Look, here we go. Ground ball to the third baseman. He shuffles over to Willie Randolph. Now, by the time the ball hits, we already have, by the time he goes to pivot for first base, McCray is already past the bag. <laughs> And his shoulder is already down low, ready to deck Willie, Willie Randolph. That, I can understand, is why that's illegal. Um, that, is a, that is a crazy play. I mean, he is, he is, he is airborne. <laughs> he, that, that is so beyond a slide. I mean... <laughs> He looks like he was shot out of a cannon <laughs> at Willie Randolph. I mean, Willie had no chance to get this ball to first base. None. I mean, kudos for the cameraman, too, who just slightly got this in frame. Because <laughs> there was no way the cameraman was assuming... McCray is going to go airborne and take out this man <laughs> like a runaway Zeppelin and just, boom, hit him right in the middle of the chest because that's not how slides work. It's not how slides work. This is, this is incredible. I mean, just takes him completely out. That is why that the rule change is good. I mean, Willie, <laughs> Willie. Willie's in like shortstop. Like he, tra he traveled like thirty feet. <laughs> that should be illegal in baseball. I mean <laughs> there is no way you're supposed to travel that far. <laughs> Uh, just trying to pivot and throw to first by getting taken out by a slide. <laughs> that is why this rule exists in Major League Baseball. Not because not of Reese Hopkins and Jeff McNeil. That slide is nothing compared to this slide from 1977. It really makes you think that uh, our parents were watching a different brand of baseball. <laughs> like, wow. And, and the fact, too, the non-reaction from the ump out out nothing's wrong there he didn't even think that hey that might have been a little much it was just like yep the runner is out i mean good on willie for even holding on to the ball <laughs> good lord let me try that let me just show that again look how far willie randolph goes from the bag <laughs> i mean they basically take a vacation together wow and holding on to the baseball i mean good on willie randolph that is an intense slide 
right there. Wow. Okay. Anyway. Whew. Good Lord. Let me cut back. So, again, the Mets, uh, you know, went down 3-1 in opening, uh, opening day. I think they were more upset the fact that uh, the Mets didn't have um, – didn't have a lot of offense. They were one hit on opening day. And uh, this game over in uh, – it doesn't seem like it's going any better. It's uh, Right now it's it's 3-1 at the end of the second for the Mets. And so it doesn't seem like it's going any better th- there for them in City Field. But hopefully uh, the offense explodes. I feel like it has too many stars. I mean, Lindor, Alonzo, uh, Jeff McNeil, Brandon Nimmo. I mean, they've got too many weapons – in that lineup for it to not really show uh, show through. I mean, you know, it, eventually they're going to erupt. It's these these first couple games after spring training, anyways, are always kind of a little bit uh, weird. You know, the f- I always feel like the um, the first month of the season is always April training, anyways. But um, we'll see. We'll see how the Mets kind of fare. I think let's give it a, like a week and a half before we really pass any kind of judgment on the Mets. I feel like under Mendoza, they're going to have a, a – and this is probably my Yankee bias showing. Under Mendoza, they're probably going to have a better a better, um, uh, a better, better skipper and better decisions being made on an everyday basis. So let's see how that goes. But um, not a great opening day for the Mets. But anyways, um, outside of uh, – man, I'm like kind of wiped from laughing that hard. Uh, uh, what, a, what a game baseball used to be in the 1970s. I'm, I'm envious of anybody who – who watched the game. Um, it's too regimented. People were throwing at each other. I mean, Roger Clemens in the eighties was throwing at everybody. Uh, in the, you know, if, if, uh, if you looked at him wrong, he was throwing, throwing at you in the early eighties. Um, man, baseball was so much, so much more fun when there were no rules. Uh, anyways, well, uh, let's try to wrap up the show so it doesn't get too long. Uh, I started watching, the first episode of Manhunt, which is the Apple Apple TV Plus new series about the uh, assassination of uh, President Lincoln uh, during the uh, uh, final moments of the, the the Civil War after the Civil War had ended, and uh, the first episode is pretty good. I mean, there are some uh, definitely recognizable actors in here, um, uh, including the the. The man who plays uh, Edward Stanton, who was also Prince Charles, uh, excuse me, Prince Philip in, I believe, the third and fourth season, the second incarnation of the cast of The Crown. So seeing him again as Ed Stanton was uh, kind of interesting because you're like, aren't you uh, part of the royal family? Um, It gets weird when you start recognizing uh, actors from thing to thing. Um, It doesn't quite take you out of the action the way that... um, like Brad Pitt does in, in the movie Seven Years a Slave. I mean, that clearly is Brad Pitt, and he's trying to play somebody else, and you're like, this takes me completely out of the movie. But it is a, uh interesting dramatization of the aftermath and the chase for John Wilkes Booth. It's The first episode is very much Ford's theater um, and the assassination. It's setting up what they're going to do afterwards to catch John Wilkes Booth. Um, very interesting because if you've been to any historical civil war site, I feel like you've seen this moment in history, which is, you know, if not the most important turning point in American history, um, probably outside of the revolutionary war, right? You've seen this moment dramatized so many different ways, right? What, and so to see a different take on it and to see a, a little bit of more of an emotional, um take on it is very very interesting it's very um they do a good job even though it's well-worn territory i guess is what i'm trying to say like everyone knows what happens this this moment in time has been his has been pounded into people's history into people's brains um so much because it's so important right it is it is literally a a very very defining moment in american history right um if not the encapsulation of we are going to stay united no matter what happens to us, right? That is what really defines that American um, patriotism right there of like, is the country going to fall apart after something as crazy and heinous as this? So to see it dramatized like this is very, 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 very cool. They do a good job. They It's very dark. Like it's a, it's a dark series. And 
whether that's I found myself questioning myself whether it was my TV or whether it was just the fact that they're trying to be historically accurate to the time, right? There's not that many torches or or lanterns or lights or whatever, right, that, that are going to be around um, unless you're a theater, right? Like Ford's Theater is very lit and it's very, you can see that the advancements at the time were kind of relegated to those kind of places, not exactly, um, you know, the houses in the area, right? So, uh, this is going to go on a seven episode run. Um, I'm really interested to keep going on it. It's, it's, uh, if you start reading about this moment in time and how orchestrated this was, um, and, and they do get into that, that, uh, you know, this assassination was not just Lincoln. It was, it was Andrew Johnson at the time. It was William Seward at the time. It was an orchestrated attack. I think, um, to see how they kind of kind of reflect that in an accurate manner will be will be fascinating, right? They they've already kind of said that they've fictionalized parts of it to kind of create drama or whatever you're gonna you kind of do. You have to kind of expect that with any historical drama that it's gonna be based on a true story, not exactly the true retelling, which is probably going to elicit a lot of historians saying this is not accurate at all. This is not accurate. The time frame doesn't work this way. And so it's probably good for them to get ahead of that and go, hey, listen, we, we're doing this to try to make this as entertaining as possible, not literally beat for beat what happened in history. Um, but uh, very, very cool uh, to see this type of show being uh, put on. Apple TV Plus seems to be the place where you're going to find really dramatic shows, right? I mean, at each end of the spectrum, right? You have The Morning Show, which is heavy, heavy. And then you have Ted Lasso, which is really, really happy, but also really, really heavy. And now you have uh, a, a drama about the assassination of President Lincoln, which is really, really heavy. Um, so if you're looking for a, you know, a light, uh, breezy, uh, viewing experience. This is not for you, right? Uh, this is this is well acted, crown like drama, um, and uh, it seems really good to me. But it's only after the first episode, so I would recommend it. Go check it out if you if you're if you like history, if you like um, anything that's that's delving into this this area. Watch it just to see the set pieces. They're really impressive. It really makes you feel like you're in uh, nineteen mid nineteenth century Washington, right? And um, and it, it really transports you back in time, right? It's watching the best visitor center movie you could ever produced. <laughs> it's, it's watching the series. But anyways, the show's getting a little bit long, so I'm going to cut it off there. Uh, this is, again, the uh, Powell Not Found podcast uh, hosted by Mark Powell. Uh, go ahead and uh, try to support the show by going to the YouTube channel at youtube.com slash at symbol Powell not found. And also you can find us on Apple podcast and I'm going to probably push out to Spotify and to, um, to the other uh, Google play, whatever kind of apps uh, to try to get this as much exposure as possible. For those of you that have been listening, thank you for uh, listening to the show and we'll be back next week. I'm sure with more baseball opinions, cause we'll have a week under our belt. And so definitely more opinions on how, on who's hot, who's not, um, and uh, who's helping the team, who's not helping the team, and uh, some more movie recommendations, maybe a summary of what the show Manhunt really is like, not just after one episode. Who knows? It's really whatever I want to talk about here on the Pal Not Found podcast. Thank you, guys. I'll see you next week. Gardens